All right. Well, it's four o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, and I'll just kind of do a little intro here, just go over the basic uh, basics of the Zoom webinar setup, um, and then I'll let you guys go ahead and take it away. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight for Hiking Trails of the Pacific Northwest, the virtual book tour. Um, we're very excited that you all could join us this evening. Uh, my name is Natalie Ferraro. I'm the engagement manager for Trail Keepers of Oregon. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with us, Trail Keepers of Oregon is an all-volunteer nonprofit uh, we, uh, whose mission is to protect and enhance the Oregon hiking experience through stewardship, advocacy, and education. Um, we're really excited to have everyone joining us tonight. This has proven to be a very popular event. So we're uh, excited to have our special guests here. Big thanks to Bill, Bart, and Craig for being here. Um, a little bit of housekeeping for all of you who are watching. Um, we will be taking questions throughout the event, but they will be answered at the end. So if you have a question at the bottom of your screen, if you move your mouse around, you should see two little chat bubbles that say Q&A next to it. Um, you can uh, enter any questions you have in there and I will, if there are technical questions, I can help answer those and then we'll go through them and our panelists will answer them at the end if you have a question for our panelists. Um, so please use that Q&A function. Um, if you have any um, comments or things like that that you want to throw up there, feel free to use the chat function, which is separate from the Q&A. There's another option for chat. Um, if you want to say hello or anything like that, you can use the chat function. Um, if as we're going along, I know a lot of you who are attending have already purchased a copy of the book, but for those of you who haven't, I'm going to put a link in the chat here. So that'll kind of help you find it as well. Um, if any of you who don't have a copy of the book yet, or maybe you don't win one during our raffle uh, later this evening, you can head to this link and it will still be open to purchase the book um, until later this evening. And uh, along with the book, you will also receive a Trail Keepers of Oregon annual membership. So uh, get a little bonus there. Um, great, uh, let's see. A little bit about TKO. We uh, work on hiking trails all across Oregon. Of course, we're going to be hearing about trails from across the Pacific Northwest. So I know there's probably a lot of you hailing from Washington this evening. So don't worry, we haven't forgot about you. Um, and uh, the cool thing is, is that this book, uh, part of the proceeds are actually going to support trail stewardship. So um, some of the profits from this book are going to support us here at Trail Keepers. And for those of you in Washington, it's also going to support the Washington Trails Association. So um, uh, thank you for the three of you for coming together on this effort and uh, for creating such a beautiful book. Um, there is a quick question here in the Q&A. Yes, those of you who purchased the $75 um, uh, entry, uh, ticket for this event, you will be receiving a copy of the book. I just added the link there for those who hadn't um, chosen that option and maybe decide to later on this evening. So um, if you purchase the copy of the book as part of your registration, rest assured you will receive that. Um, and then we will be uh, raffling off a copy, five copies of the book at the end of the event as well. So stay tuned for that. All right, um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let um, Bill and Bart and Craig take it away. Thank you guys. All right, thank you, Natalie. Uh, welcome and thanks for joining us. Uh, I sort of write all the hiking guides for Oregon and Craig does the same thing for Washington and Bart is the amazing photographer um, who's hiked every long range trail in the country, it seems. Uh, and uh, today we're going to uh, celebrate the most glorious trails in the Northwest, but also explore some of the less known ones. We want to get people off the beaten track a little bit that's one of the goals with this uh, book. And I think something we should all be doing now, is, especially when you try to be uncrowded. Uh, so we're each gonna tell a little bit about ourselves. And because Bart is the star of the show as the photographer, I thought we'd start with Bart and tell us a little bit how he got to be known as the man who hiked tall. What is that about, Bart? Yes, well, thank you, Bill. Yeah, if people Googled me, they'd see uh, if the Google link is the man who hiked tall. And when I saw that, I was uh, curious because I'm 5'10 on a good day. But uh, it's a link to a backpacker magazine that uh, describes my story of walking and photographing all of America's national trails, which um, 
Latin started, so, if you go way back when. Um, the, so it's really, it's short for the man, the man who hiked them all, right? That's correct. That's okay, correct. all right. Yep. And uh, yeah, so there's uh, me at uh, early me in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And one of the most impactful uh, things in my life looking back was when my parents chose to move to the Seattle area in large measure because my dad just absolutely loved hiking and the outdoors. And so we as a family constantly were um, going all over the, the Northwest. And on all these um, outings, sometimes quite ambitious, my dad would always bring his uh, keen exact uh, German camera with him. And uh, it just it instilled a love of photography and hiking in myself. And now this, this image is from when I was in my 20s and I was uh, photographing with a point and shoot. And I didn't really know what I was doing, but people um, really enjoyed the photograph, the image. And one fellow made it into a um, poster. And I thought that, you know, maybe I could make a living as a, uh, as unrealistic as I knew it was. I thought maybe I could make a living as a, a nature photographer, or at least give it a try. And I always wanted to do the uh, Pacific Crest Trail. So uh, I thought, well, I'll get a SLR camera and a tripod and a lens and uh, see what I can do. And this was in 1992. And I spent uh, six years walking and photographing the Pacific Crest Trail, which was such a cool, I mean, op photo opportunity because there's so many different environments to explore. And it took uh, six years and, and then finally did get a publisher involved. Uh, interested and I uh, was able to work with Karen Berger, which has proven to be really important through the years because I've worked with her several times, but the book did really well. And I thought, okay, maybe, you know, I, I was doing construction work as a living, but I thought maybe I could keep this thing going and, you know, finally, may, maybe I found my calling. So I went to the Appalachian Trail and um, hiked it. And the year that I hiked it, 1998, was, um, I was fortunate because Earl Schaefer who I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with him, but he was the first person credited with walking the Appalachian Trail as a through hike in 1948. And here in 1998, he was doing the 50th anniversary. And so he, he and I got together and um, we uh, did the, this book, The Appalachian Trail, Calling Me Back to the Hills. And it was just a fantastic experience to get to know Earl and his um, family because he was quite the character. Um, and, I, and I'm so glad we got the book done because he passed away shortly after the book was published. So I, now I have two books published and I, I just keep going on to the next trail. And I was just fascinated with Florida, just the concept of it. I've never even been to the, I had never been to the state of Florida. And so um, what better way to uh, discover a state by, than by walking 1,300 miles of the uh, Florida Trail. And I just love the experience of the different environments, the swamps, the birds, uh, really remarkable um, part of our country. And uh, so then the next was on to my old home state of Wisconsin, uh, the Wisconsin Ice Age Trail. And the year I did that was they had the highest uh, mosquito hatch that they've had in history, according to the uh, newspaper. So I had to wear this mosquito netting for two weeks and I was actually um, pulled over by the police on two different occasions and interrogated by detectives because they thought I was a, um, running a meth lab in the woods. Um, but uh, then I returned in the fall when it was much better weather and I've returned many times actually to re-photograph the trail. And that's what I've done with all these trails. It's I like hike them, then I re-photograph them. So now I thought that maybe I could walk all eight National Scenic Trails. Only one other person had done that. Uh, this is the Natchez Trace, and it's an easy trail. It is one of the National Scenic Trails, um, and that's a short, really fun hike, but the big challenge was the uh, the North Country Trail, because it's, uh, of all the North National Scenic Trails, it's by far the longest. It's uh, 4,400 miles, and I'd say it's actually longer than that. It goes from New York to North Dakota, and uh, my wife had this brilliant idea that I put the backpack on a baby jogger because I'd been walking for like a thousand miles and really struggling with the uh, carrying the camera gear but I'm not gonna it's the camera gear that gives me the um, sense of purpose but uh, so she said why not on the road sections put it on a baby jogger and I've never had such an epiphany as when I put the you know 70 pound backpack on the baby jogger and was able to make really good time and I was able to complete the North Country Trail. So then there was one more trail to hike and that was the Continental Divide Trail. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't use the baby jogger on that. So I had to carry that beast 3,200 uh, miles along the CDT, photographing the entire way um, and you know, giving me a so sense of self purpose 
And um, I finished this Continental Divide Trail at uh, Yellowstone. And then the next day, gave a talk at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC. So I was nip and tuck whether, and, uh, whether I'd make it, but that was for the 40th uh, commemoration ceremony of the National Trails Act. So I now walked all eight National Scenic Trails and then almost immediately, so that was my project to walk and photograph all the trails, but almost immediately then the Obama administration along with Congress passed the uh, 2009 Omnibus Wilderness Bill, which created three new national scenic trails. So the very next year, I was walking the Arizona Trail and the uh, New England Trail and the uh, Pacific Northwest Trail. They're the three new additions. And um, really exciting trails. They, they all deserve to be in the national scenic trails. And uh, I finished at uh, Cape Alava, and there's my wife. She came out to to greet me and um, so finished the Pacific Northwest Trail. So I now walked all 11 and photographed them. And I can't um, give my wife enough credit. She's half this team. I mean, the whole time I'm gone, she's taking care of the house. And I, I mean, there's no way I could have done this without her help and support. And uh, was able to get the book on the, uh, on the showcasing the National Scenic Trails. So, and then I wanted to do all the historic trails. So I kept, uh, got to keep this thing going. And I walked, um, started the Ness Pierce Trail. I didn't know if it was, if it was gonna be successful because they're not designed to be walked. They're not intended to be walked. So I knew it was an unusual thing to do, but just the concept of walking in the footsteps of the travelers from all those years ago for the 19 different national historic trails. I just thought if I could do it, it would be so cool. And um, here with the Oregon Trail as an example of sharing the experience, 170 years ago, the pioneers had this common saying as to whether you see the elephant or not. And in that case, uh, it was like here, I, that was me seeing the elephant. It's just an amazing thunderstorm over um, Rock, Jail Rock, which is an important landmark. And so it was just walking the historic trails, a really cool um, uh, it took it took me uh, eight seven years, and if there's one takeaway out of walking all of the national scenic trails that I just want to shout from the rooftops, that I mean this experience that I had is just how nice everybody was along the like I say thirty five thousand miles. I never had a bad experience um, with anybody. In, in fact, it's just the opposite, where people would be kind, supportive. Uh, in this case, it was a farmer who asked to walk with me for five miles, and his wife gave me a some treats. And that was not unusual, that kind of thing. So I feel very blessed to have had that experience. And so my goal was to do a book on the um, National Historic Trails. And it just came out this past uh, month. And Karen Berger, once again, does the um, the text. And Ken Burns does the forward. And then while I'm doing all that, then I'm doing, <laughs> when I'm home, I'm photographing the trails of the Pacific Northwest, which is um, what we're here to talk about today. And I'm so honored really to be able to work with Craig and Bill on this project. Um, and so that, and look forward to being able to talk to you with about some of the trails of the Pacific Northwest. An amazing story, Bart. And now uh, there are two co-authors here. Craig covered the Washington part and his story is just also amazing. Tell us a bit about yourself, Craig. Well, it's great to be to be working with you guys too. My background actually started as a cyclist. I was a long distance cyclist starting my teens. By the time I was 20 years old, I had bicycled across America three times in most of Canada. Uh, here I am with Vic Atia. This is in 1980 for you long-term Oregonians. He invited me in. I was doing a fundraiser for the 65 Roses Foundation. My second trip, I was here I'm out in Washington, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I grew up in New England. I, I didn't move out to Washington until 1989, uh, my fourth trip actually, and I didn't turn around that time, uh, though I still go back to New England frequently. This is in um, the White Mountains of New Hampshire. I was a backcountry ranger there, uh, and I worked at ski resorts back there, and this was just from this fall, so I still, still go back uh, quite a bit. Um, but I got the hiking bug after all those years of cycling and realized there's so many trails right in my backyard, and I went to the off the road, and, but instead of just concentrating in the backyard, I wanted to see the world because I just wanted to hike. So I went down and I did a two month trip in South America, uh, back in Torres de Paine in Chile, back when Pinochet was uh, still in power down there. That's how long ago I was there. Um, and I ended up going to, um, to Asia to hike. Uh, that woman holding the South Korean flag with me, uh, we met at the University of Washington. I went back to school in my thirties, met her. Uh, she became my wife. We ended up uh, just this incredible lifestyle of, of hiking and traveling. Um, 
So we loved it so much that we actually spent five seasons uh, as uh, hiking mountain guides in Europe. This is in Bulgaria, one of the highest summits in Bulgaria. And this is, we were working for mountain hiking holidays, which I uh, used to be walking softly right in Portland. Uh, I hiked all over the, the West Coast, the East Coast. Um, and then eventually I had to decide, I, I bring it together to become a, a guidebook author. And it just, the Mountaineers, I ended up with the new day hiking series, kind of uh, in the footprints of um, uh, Harvey Manning and Iris Spring and covering the Olympics, covering the, the North Cascades here, uh, close to where I live now. Um, all kinds of adventures up in Mount Olympus, uh, doing uh, backpacking books, Eastern Washington, this is in the, the uh, Selkirk range and the Kettle, the Kettle River range, British Columbia, I live pretty close to BC and, and go up there frequently, uh, love BC, did some writing in that area. Um, the interior of BC, where, where, where Natalie hails from, this is outside of uh, Trail BC, out in the Kootenay region. Um, so just uh, bringing it all together to, to, to um, bring my love of writing and hiking and and uh, along the way, too, I had a couple of crises, a couple of midlife crises. Uh, one of them, uh, right before I turned 50, I became an ultra runner. Uh, so this is my, uh, I ran the White River 50-mile race. I did 50, my first 50-mile run for my 50th birthday. This is down by Mount Rainier. And I'm still ultra running, and I'm looking at something even bigger for my 60th birthday coming up. Um, so the, the, the great thing about ultra running uh, worked out perfect with uh, my, you know, I'm writing about two to three books a year. I can cover a lot more ground. Now, um, so a lot quicker. So whether I'm doing the Lewis Trail, I, I just travel around, uh, really love uh, trail running. I've been a regular runner for years. My second crisis, um, I became a dad in my early 50s and, and absolutely loved it. Um, and that actually slowed me down a little. Um, so I was able to start looking at things as, as a child again. This is, and I, I've been enjoying this process all the way. I've been doing urban trail books now, which is wonderful, very, very family friendly. Um, it, so these are some of the guidebooks I've written covering all over Washington and the urban trail books. I have a, my latest one is found in uh, the Portland area, Vancouver, Washington, which is where my wife hails from. I uh, spent a lot of time in Vancouver. Um, and then I was uh, honored to do the uh, 100 Classic Hikes because Manning and Spring had done the original and carrying on their tradition. It was just an honor for me to, to do the new edition and, and really expand upon that. So this has been great working on this book as well. Well, extremely qualified for writing about uh, Washington, D.C. My background is in Oregon. I'm a fifth generation Oregonian. And so my job was to write about the trails of Oregon and Northern California. I got my start in this business as the uh, decided I wanted to visit all the wilderness areas in Oregon and naively thought the easy way to do this would be to hike through them all at once. So I went from the westernmost point of the state at Cape Blanco alone with a backpack to the easternmost point in Hell's Canyon in two months. And along the way, I kept this journal of my adventures, listening for a coyote. And I was held at gunpoint by marijuana growers. I poisoned myself with mushrooms along the way. I, was, I wound up hiking 40 miles a day through Hell's Canyon, trying to outrun these October snowstorms. This day, it amazes me that people read this book and it makes them want to go hiking. They could see it away. It's kind of become a classic, though it was chosen one of Oregon's 100 books. The other adventure memoir is that I've written is the true story of the log cabin that my wife and I built by hand. This is out in the wilds of Oregon's coast range. There's no road, no electricity. We built it using only hand tools, just a crosscut saw and an ax, partly to prove you could do it the pioneer way and partly because we were broke at the time. The whole house cost $400. We still live there in the summer. I have a typewriter and I write my novels out there because my background actually was in creative writing. I studied that at Cornell. My father was the newspaper editor in Salem. And so I've done a whole series of murder mysteries set in Oregon. The one in the middle is my bestseller at Timberline Lodge, um, the classic mystery of what happened to D.B. Cooper, the guy who parachuted with a quarter million dollars and got away with it. And I, then I've done a series of historical novels that are set in the Viking age in Scandinavia. Uh, my background is Danish and we speak that language. Um, and each of these is based on the actual excavation of a real Viking ship. And then tells the story on the left at the start of the Viking age in Norway and the middle in Denmark. I still have a year to go to finish the one about Swedish Vikings. I am a fifth generation Oregonian. So I've done a couple of books on Oregon history. The one on the left is the human history the wagon train routes, gold mining ghost towns, Indian legends, and how to find all these places. Do little hikes there. The one on the right is scarier. That's floods, fires, earthquakes, 
the natural history of Oregon. Uh, and a couple that cover all of Oregon. Upper left is the Wilderness Atlas. This is the guide for adventurers with detailed maps of every wilderness. The one in the middle, my kids call the Wussy Hiking Guide. This is all in color, it does have easier trips, but they're all gorgeous. It's kind of a warm up for this big coffee table book that uh, we did with Bart. And then on the right, Oregon Favorites, that's the month by month. Every month of the year, I recommend half a dozen appropriate things to do in that season. So you miss the mosquitoes and you get there for the wildflowers. My best sellers are the 100 hikes books for Oregon. I've hiked every trail I could find in the state. I've divided the state up into five regions and update these books every year or two. And that's important because there've been a lot of changes lately. Uh, fires have changed a lot of things. Uh, and there also are new permit regulations for a lot of crowded trails. And I, uh, I, I do reprint these books every year or two, but I post the updates every week on my website for free. Um, at the back of each book, there's a list of a hundred more hikes. So there's like actually a thousand trails that I cover in Oregon. That's really important to get away from the crowds. And that's really been one of my goals uh, in writing these books is to not only showcase these gorgeous places, but also show you some places where you can get away from the crowds. And that's what we wanted to talk about in this hiking trail to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so Bart and I are gonna walk you through first a few very popular, heavily used trails, and then we'll take you to some lesser known ones in Oregon and Northern California. And then later we'll turn it over to Craig and he and Bart can talk about. So Multnomah Falls is the number one most popular, heavily used trail in Oregon. You must have had a lot of pictures of this on hand, right, Bart? Yeah, I mean, you'd think so, right? But uh, this is actually the most recent image that I that's in the entire book. I took this in February of this year because uh, the ed editor called me up and said, hey, do you have a photograph of Multnomah Falls? And I was like, oh my God, I don't think I do. <laughs> so so I, this was I, after I, the fight. This was yeah. after the fire. This is and this past see, February. This is as recent as February. And, yeah. and you can see the trees look fine. Uh, these pictures, I guess, were before the fire, but it actually looks a lot like this in the Columbia Gorge again already. The Eagle Creek fire three years ago uh, did not burn most of the trees, only on ridge tops and viewpoints cleared out the views. Uh, it just swept through the underbrush and that has come back very well. Uh, and it's really been the trail keepers of Oregon that have been the diehard workers in rebuilding these trails. Now here on the Eagle Creek Trail, probably the second most popular trail in the gorge, maybe in all of Oregon, uh, they helicoptered in eight bridges to replace the ones that burned. That trail is, is finished, but like many of them in the gorge, closed because of the virus. You just can't have that many people on a crowded trail. Uh, and that really is a problem at other places too, like Jefferson Park, a very beautiful Shangri-La at the foot of Mount Jefferson. I guess, Bart, you've been there many times. Absolutely, yeah. One of my, I mean, it's everybody's favorite place, right? Um, I mean, if you're there in the July, it's its hard to beat the wildflowers, just the Indian paintbrush, it's just stunning. And this image, uh, I was gonna photograph the moonrise and this storm just blew up. It's just really something to witness. But uh, the lightning that you see there actually started a forest fire that burned for over a month. Um, so, and, you know, it's part of the nature, but uh, boy, to see it actually happen is, is pretty amazing. And that is an issue at Jefferson Park because this September, one of the wildfires swept through Jefferson Park and burned all three of the access trails to this beautiful place but it burned very lightly. It went very quickly because at that elevation, the trees are quite sparse. And so it's still going to be just this pretty. The, however, it's so crowded that starting in May, you're going to have to buy a, an advanced permit online uh, to go to on this hike or any of 23 of the most heavily used trails near Bend. Uh, so maybe we should be looking at other places and probably not a place to look is Crater Lake to get away from the crowds. Actually, not many Oregonians go to Crater Lake, but it's heavily used by foreign tourists and out-of-staters. Um, you've been here many times, right, Bart, or several? Yeah, yeah, and I've noticed. I mean, it is amazing through the years just to see how much more 
uh, uh, evidence of a lot of folks, you know, coming by, coming to the rim of uh, of Crater Lake. But I mean, it's, it's such a big national, you know, it, it's a big place, and uh, so you can go there and um, in different times of the year and not see people at all. And uh, and there's different parts of the park that you can um, discover. This is Magnum Bog, which hardly anybody goes to, but it's a really beautiful little place. So there are other options that uh, you know people can take when they go to the National uh, to Crater National Park. Yeah, and this is uh, on the way to Crater Lake is Tokety Falls along the North Umpqua River. People drive right by it on the, on the way to Crater Lake. There's a whole string of beautiful waterfalls on that road. You have to hike about a half mile to get to each. That's I think one of the hidden treasures of Crater Lake are the less known trails and the ones just outside the park boundary. Now let's go down to California and you think, oh man, that's gonna be crowded. Not if you know where to go. So where are we here? This is uh, Caribou Basin. And this was, I, I've always wanted to hike in the Trinity Alps well, on the Pacific Crest Trail. It touches on it, touches on, on them. But with this book, it gave me the impetus to go out there and, and uh, uh, hiked to different, a couple different locations. And Caribou Basin was just spectacular. Uh, really cool part of the um, Northern California that I have never been to, but very glacial. Uh, reminded me a bit of the uh, Sierras, but um, I didn't, I don't think I saw any people the whole time I was. Hiking. Well, the, the real trick is that Caribou Basin, the trailhead aims toward Oregon. So all the crowds from San Francisco don't find it. It's kind of a hidden part of California. So are there really this many deer there? Uh, on this case, there was. Uh, um, yeah, I saw this fellow at, uh, in the, it was pitch black at night and I had my flashlight on and his eyes were just reflecting the light and they looked very uh, like demonic. And I, I, I'll tell you, it almost gave me a heart attack. But then the next day it's like, oh, here he is. He's just uh, hanging around at the uh, trail. <laughs> <laughs> so now let's go up the Oregon coast. And uh, this had been a, a, a a main route for recreational vehicles and bicyclists for years, but now the state legislature has passed a bill to complete the Oregon Coast Trail, 365 miles, the whole length of the coast, uh, and move it off the highway shoulder uh, to make it more scenic. Now here we're going by uh, the most photographed lighthouse in Oregon, that's the Seabed Lighthouse. Uh, what else did you find on the Oregon coast, Bart? Well, I mean, from a photographer's standpoint of view, it's just, um, it's so beautiful the entire way. I, and to me, it's so exciting that they're, uh, to the, at this day, it's easy to think that maybe all the trails are already built and everything, but the fact that they're building this amazing new trail that's going to be, you know, following the entire coastline of Oregon is really exciting. I really tip my hat to all the people that are working on that. It, it, I want to walk it. It's on my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> well, the legislature didn't authorize any money for this at all. So it's all being built by volunteers and with donations. So trail keepers of Oregon are at work uh, finishing the Oregon Coast Trail the sections that need to be done. Now we're going to, uh, oh, I have to tell us how you got this picture of the arch rocks at uh, Oceanside. Well, what's kind of cool, this was actually the last night of my uh, photographing the Oregon coast for this book. And I wanted to get one kind of special shot. And I uh, thought that maybe I could get the sunset through Cave Rock. And uh, sure enough, uh, there it is. It was just a really spectacular. Uh, Unbelievable. And this is also the oldest wildlife refuge in the country. It's the very first wildlife refuge because of the seabirds that nest out on that rock. Nice. Jump over to Eastern Oregon. And when Western folks think about Eastern Oregon and hiking, they think of the Wallowa Mountains, the Eagle Cap Wilderness way out in the far north east corner. But on the way there, they drive right past these mountains. Now, wh when did you take this picture of the Blue Mountains? Yeah, this was I, um, when, when I was walking the Oregon Trail through uh, Baker Valley and I, you know, it was interesting to read the uh, pioneers' description of the blues because it was like for them it was like one more barrier they had to go over. They just wanted to get to, you know, Portland by this time. But uh, I, I was thinking, you know, I wonder if there's any trails in the blues. You don't. I didn't, hadn't heard much about hiking in the blues, and uh, I was so uh, so fun to explore the Elkhorn Crest Trail 
um, that goes for how what 25 miles through the uh, yeah. blues and really yeah, it, it, it to me it strikes me as an ambitious trail to put in because it really goes through some rugged area. Yeah, this is uh, not in the Wallawas, but rather in the Elkhorn range of the Blue Mountains. So it's often overlooked, but it's a world-class trail and it's going through granite. This granite, they use a lot of dynamite to blow out this trail there. Um, so it's more like the Alps or the Sierras. And you are almost certain to see wildlife. There are so many um, the, of the, uh, uh, the mountain goats that they have to put out salt blocks so that they'll lick the salt off of the blocks instead of your tent and backpack. They're a nuisance, actually. So why did you take this picture? This yeah, is a this, mountainous I'm always, I'm always a, a sucker for whimsy. I love photographing anything that strikes me as whimsical. And I had just gotten out of the uh, out of the car, and this is on the not far from the trailhead going up to Strawberry Lake. And um, I just it looked like the trail was uh, smiling at me. So I thought, you know, I'll take a photograph of that. And I was kind of surprised that they put it in the book, but I'm glad they did. It's a, it's a interesting shot. <laughs> then you go up to Strawberry Lake and this is actually going to be a part of the Blue Mountains Trail. And this had been a, a concept for quite a while, but now there's a lot of traction to finish this long range trail that will start at John Day, go through the Strawberry Mountains here, follow the length of the Elkhorns through crest a trail through uh, the Blue Mountains and wind up at Joseph in the Wallapas. Amazing long range trail. And it shows that Eastern Oregon is not all desert. Most people think, oh, it's just sagebrush. But here, the Strawberry Mountains look like a chunk of the Canadian Rockies dropped in to Eastern Oregon. If you want desert and uh, wide open spaces, go to Steen's Mountain. What have you got a picture of here? Um, and this is another area that I always wanted to visit. So I was so glad to have the opportunity to photograph the Steens Mountain, which uh, that's, that's a bighorn sheep up there in the, and it's protected in the wilderness area. They do hunting out of the wilderness, but um, just such a wide open, just a fascinating part of the country um, for me. And it's what's so uh, with the uplift that the uh, Steens cause, you oftentimes get really dramatic uh, clouds like over at Alverd Lake. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's just uh, a really unique place to visit or to photograph. Yeah, this is uh, Wild Horse Lake as seen from the trail to the summit. Uh, Steens Mountain is the 10th tallest mountain in Oregon and you can drive to within a half mile of the summit. Uh, so you're at 9,500 feet when you start the hike down to Wild Horse Lake in this hanging valley carved by a glacier in the ice age. The, East face of Steens Mountain is a vertical cliff and it blocks the, the rain. So on the east side is the Alvord Desert, the driest spot in Oregon where it sometimes doesn't rain for a year at a time. And I actually recommended that Bart drive across this desert to go hike a trail that was not built by human beings. Is this really an alien trail that you hiked? Uh, well, and Gap? It's pretty close to, it, it does look like Mars actually when you're up there, but uh, no, it just uh, here again, just beautiful part of the country. And it's the, uh, where the wild horses would, would go down through there. Is that correct? Yeah, the wild horses uh, built a trail to get down to a spring near the Alvor Desert. And it makes a hiking trail that you're not gonna see a lot of other people on, but you might see a horse. Beyond that, you think this is the wildest spot. It is not. Beyond Steens Mountain to the east is the Owyhee Canyonlands country. And this is the biggest, wildest, most undeveloped spot in the lower 48 in the contiguous US. This is a spot where you turn on your radio, you get nothing but static no matter how long or where you turn the dial. Uh, trailheads can be 50 miles of gravel, dirt road to get to. Uh, the only really developed and protected spot is the little state park there at Leslie Gulch, where I think you took some of these pictures, right, Bart? Yeah, yeah. What a what a neat place. I mean, what what was so cool about it is there's about four different canyons that you can adventure into, and each one has its own characteristic uh, character. And uh, here again, just a really cool part of the country that I'd never been to before. Really cool, and actually quite uh, fragile and endangered. Uh, it, the Owyhee Canyonlands were almost made a national monument by uh, Obama at the end of his administration, but not quite. And there's been efforts to make this a wilderness, a national, uh, it's just uh, 
as beautiful as the national parks in Utah, but without any protection. So this is a place we really need hikers to come, to fall in love with, and then to get mad if uh, it gets developed for, um, uh, by foreign co mining companies. But now we're gonna turn back and stay in the desert, get closer to Bend, uh, to Fort Rock. This is, if you're heading out east from Bend, southeast, it's where the trees give out and you wind up at this, what looks like a fortress in, in the desert. Uh, a nice place to photograph, I'm guessing, Bart? Absolutely, yeah. And it, at this time, I was photographing with a four by, uh, four by five, which you got the, got the curtain over my back. And um, just what a, a real mystical place to me. I mean, it's just an interesting juxtaposition of this massive rock in the middle of this uh, sea of sagebrush. And a uh, um, really cool place. <laughs> I keep saying that, but. Uh, yeah, you can hike. You can hike around the inside or the outside of this ring. It actually, uh, it looks like a fortress, but it was a, a volcanic, volcanic explosion crater uh, and uh, is where the, the earliest proven evidence of human beings in North America has been found. In a cave near here, they've found uh, DNA that's 14,000 years old, showing that people showed up here in Oregon uh, very early. Uh, a lot of uh, recent lava in the area and right next to Fort Rock is crack in the ground, uh, a two mile walk that's kind of weird. What did you think, Bart? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's like a novelty hike, uh, but it reminded me of the um, slot canyons in Arizona where uh, it's kind of spooky ambiance about it, um, but fascinating geology. And I, I just thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I, I would recommend if anybody's in, near Christmas Valley, you, it's, you wouldn't want to pass it up. It's, it's really, really fun to check out. So we've spiraled around Oregon from some of the heavily used trails to some of the less known ones. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Craig and Bart to talk about Washington and British Columbia. And I'm wondering, Craig, why you started with this picture? Well, it's just this little mountain that it, almost everybody in Washington has, has seen at some point. And you can pretty much see it from almost any part of Washington. I mean- Mount really Rainier, right? Iconic. What's that? Mount Rainier. Yeah, about right here. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I was <laughs> trying to remember what it is. Yeah, <laughs> it is an iconic peak of the Northwest, uh, 14,410 feet. Um, just, you know, it's, it's just an amazing peak. Uh, and you can see it from almost everywhere. A lot of people want to climb it. It's on their bucket list. But for hikers, I'll tell you, there's some great options there. And, and Bart's going to uh, show you the Wonderland Trail, which goes right around Mount Rainier. Yeah, and you know, I, I actually have not hiked the Wonderland Trail as a in complete form. But what's so great about it? I mean, you can do day hikes and uh, section hikes, and it, it, it's hard to find a trail with with uh, so much variety that uh, it circles one mountain. And it um, you can always do day hikes, you know, from the trail itself. Um, and like this was from uh, Goat Mountain, and. Uh, but the trail itself, it is becoming, you know, it's, it's so popular that uh, you do need permits, but there's nothing to say. You can't do a day, you know, day hikes all, all around the mountain. Right. And it's in what, the Wonderland Trail. Most people will do it uh, five to eight days, you, can, you know, but there's lots of great day hikes. We talked about um, a lot of the urban trails, too. Uh, I mean, most people, you can see Mount Rainier from Seattle and Tacoma and all the big cities in Puget Sound. But there's all these little parks that are right in your backyard. And so, so Bart, what, what is the significance? Yeah, this is, of this, is a, this is like 15 miles from my house. It's a Snake Lake uh, Nature Reserve in downtown Tacoma. And uh, it, it, whenever I feel like uh, I'd like to photograph birds and anything and everything, it's amazing how much is there. And it's right by the highway. But so, I mean, these state parks and reserves are so valuable um, in the lower Puget Sound and, and afford you know, people access. Uh, this, the uh, Larrabee State Park is just uh, 15 miles from Bellingham. And you can you know, walk on the Fragrance Lake Trail, which is what this is. And immediately you feel like you're uh, in the um, deep forest uh, miles from anywhere. So, and, these, and these urban trails are so important is that they're accessible to so many uh, underserved communities. And you know, we have this emphasis of the back country, but trying to get people connected right where they live. And, and, and so I'm, I'm glad to see that we're putting a big emphasis on, on, the, on the backyard wildernesses. Right on. 
And this, this uh, trail is the um, artist viewpoint. And I just wanted to choose something that might be good for winter time, being now that we're heading into winter. So and, you um, it's it's uh, Mount Baker. Well, artist viewpoint, Mount Baker, and then there's Mount Shutsan. And um, the, uh, I, I mean, it's just paradise when you get up there. If you want, if you're interested in cross country skiing or something like that, um, the, it's easy to access and it's just spectacular. Yeah, and, and Mount Baker, it, it's just an amazing, you know, I can see it from where I live. It, it, it is our iconic peak here. A lot of people come up from Seattle think, oh, it's so far from Seattle, but they forget that Mount Baker is, you can see it from all over Vancouver and, and Abbotsford and those there. So right now, it's a good time to come up there because they can't come over the border. <laughs> so. And, and I, I don't know if people can see, but there's actually steam coming out of the side of Mount Baker there. And it's easy to forget that we have, you know, 15 or so active volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's a big part of our heritage. All right. So the next, now this is a, a spring hike. So that was a winter hike. This is what something I'd recommend for the uh, springtime around April when there's still a lot of snow in the Cascades. And this is um, Sun Lakes Dry Falls State Park in Eastern Washington. And it's just a fascinating uh, geology that was formed when the floods from the um, ice age, from the last uh, melting ice age 13,000 years ago occurred. And it was, it was, the floods were so big that it just scoured the landscape. And uh, it's a, this little hike, it's five miles. And if you have kids, it'd, it'd be a fun hike with them. And it's in the springtime, you can go there and it's warm and the flowers are out. And, uh, and I, I really enjoyed the fact that Eastern Washington is getting a little more attention uh, for hiking. Um, and here's another example. This hike is just uh, a few miles from the Sun Lakes, and it's Goose uh, Goose Lake uh, Plateau, and um, just a fascinating country, a, a part of the Washington where uh, you can go up there. I didn't see anybody all day, and I almost got the impression like I was in Mongolia or something. But you know, <laughs> in, in my little state you, of Washington, you love the just the name of the area, the Channeled Scablands. I'll tell you, uh, realtors never tell you. Would you like to buy a house in the Channeled Scablands? But <laughs> But it's an amazing place, all those coolies as you were you're showing here. Yeah. And now this was, um, th and this is a part of the um, the Strathcona Provincial Park in Vancouver Island. And I would not have, I did not know about it. And this is where Craig um, recommended that I check it out. And I'm so glad he did. It's just a really interesting um, mountain range that I had not heard about. It's Strathcona is the... Uh, uh, 500,000 acres. It's the largest park on Vancouver Island. It's actually the very first provincial park in British Columbia in 1911. It was the second place I ever took my wife backpack, you know, hiking and camping. And she fell in love with uh, the outdoors. So it's a very special place for us too. And it is going to be a workout. It's uphill. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is uh, like the gorge. Everything is straight out of these, uh, these fjord like canyons. You, you will get yeah. a workout. Here we have the West Coast Trail on, on Vancouver Island. And probably one of the, I, I would think one of the most well hiked um, populated trails, but you do have to get a permit and people wait a long time to get a permit. I, I don't know if I'll ever be able to do it because I haven't been able to get a permit, but I did um, day hikes. You can do day hikes into it. Uh, you can't do the whole thing, but like this fellow was, came from England and they had waited two years to do it. But it, it's a, just the section I did, I was surprised what, how, what a challenging trail it is when so many people walk it. Um, yeah, it, was, just, it, was, it was originally built because all the all the ships that were being wrecked along the coast there, people were stranded and they needed to get out of there. So it was a, a Coast Guard rescue trail and then just became an iconic uh, hiking trail, not only in the Pacific Northwest, but in Canada. It's one of the, it's a very popular trail. And what what's kind of neat is that if you if you can't get a permit for the uh, West Coast Trail, just just west of the West Coast Trail is the Wanda Fuca Trail, which goes for about 45 to 50 miles, and you don't need a permit for it. Um, it's not as rugged, but in, you know it's more pleasant walking and very sublime, beautiful, beautiful uh, hike. Yeah, and you can and then, do uh, section hikes on it and camp along the way. There's a couple of provincial parks there too. Really nice. Yep, exactly. So now we cross the uh, Wanda Fuca Strait, and we're in Olympic National Park my favorite place in the world. And this is a uh, lacrosse basin, that lake down there. And my brother and I hiked there the September, the year prior, last year, uh, because I wanted to photograph black bear. And 
Um, I can't tell you how successful we were to, uh, to, uh, to photograph black bear. They're everywhere there. I mean, it, the, the Lacrosse Basin, it's like a Serengeti. Uh, it's a small place, but within that little area, there's, uh, we saw a huge um, elk herd and mountain goat and coyote and about 15 to 20 black bear who they're so intent on eating the huckleberries, this is September, uh, to fatten up for the uh, winter time that, that they really have no interest in you know, people coming by, but obviously you want to give them their space and everything, but uh, uh, just a beautiful part of uh, Olympic National Park. Yeah, Olymp Olympic is just an amazing, uh, again, one of my favorite areas as well, and, and my best-selling book on the region. Uh, it, it really is um, a Serengeti. Uh, you will see bear. My record for bears in one trip is also at Lake La Crosse. Uh, it's in the heart of the Olympics. It's such a special place. It's, the shortest way in is 20 miles. It, it, you really have to work to get in there. You have to ford rivers. Uh, but you will see, you know, it's like being on one of the old Wild America shows from back in the 1980s. So yeah. Amazing place. So now we jump on uh, to, across the Cascades to uh, a, a really cool trail that goes basically it uh, follows the border of the uh, Washington and Canada and it um, it I, I walked it uh, three times and every time that I, I, I walked it uh, the Pasayton Valley area was getting more and more um, trees falling down but they've they since cut that all out so I've, I've heard that it's easier to walk now but um, it's also being uh, the, the Pacific Northwest National Scenic Trail utilizes the Boundary Trail, so more people are actually uh, starting to come through through this area now. But a beautiful part of Washington State and uh, the Pasayton Wilderness. And for folks that are interested in uh, fly fishing, the uh, Cathedral Basin area just has some fabulous cutthroat uh, uh, trout. And, and if you one of the prettiest places in the Pasayton Wilderness, that, and that's a that's an 18 mile one way to get in there. Um, so it doesn't get a lot of day use either, and, and, and a handful of Pacific Northwest through hikers. And you, you can actually, if, if you uh, plan out the trip and make sure that a taxi will pick you up at Ross Lake, you can cross Ross Lake and keep hiking over the Cascades and, and really have an adventurous, adventurous trip. Uh, here we're at uh, Rialto uh, Beach and this is, I mean, we're so blessed, you know, here in the Pacific Northwest with our incredible coastlines and Washington's is just, you know, as wild as Oregon's. And uh, this is Rialto Beach to Cape Olava. And this section is also part of the uh, Pacific Northwest Trail. It's where it uh, ends or it starts at uh, Cape Olava. And um, these images I, I took when I was walking, when I was finishing, the uh, Pacific Northwest Trail, and it was the 11th trail that I was finishing. So it was, it's, it's, when I took this image here, um, I actually had a hard time uh, focusing because I was getting emotional about it just because I'd walked all these trails and uh, I was crying like a baby when I took that photograph. But I mean, that part of um, Washington coastline is so spectacular. Yeah, absolutely. You know, other than the, the lost coast of California, the, the Olympic coast is one of the few places in, in the, the lower 48 that you can, you have a wilderness coast to hike, an incredible place. Yeah, yeah. And here we're at um, Hearts Pass, which is on the Pacific Crest Trail. And uh, the road up to Hearts Pass is kind of legendary as one of the most difficult roads to access. So that's the challenge of this, uh, of Hearts Pass. But if you can get there, um, you can't beat it. I mean, you're going to hike south or north, and if you could be there on on an October day, it's uh, just ex you know doesn't get any better. Yeah. It's the highest highest uh, drivable road in, in Washington. You can drive to 6,500 feet. There's a one wh white knuckle spot. It's called Dead Horse Point. Just don't look to the left. Yeah. And that sort of wraps up, I guess, our tour of. Uh, some of the most beautiful and often overlooked trails in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we really want to appreciate, uh, thank the Trail Keepers of Oregon and the Washington Trail Association for all the volunteer work they do to keep these trails up. And uh, Natalie, I guess, do we have any questions for the authors and photographer here today? Yes, absolutely. We had a couple of questions come through. 
Um, I think I'm going to start with one question for all three of you, though. Um, and I think everyone would want to know this. What is your personal favorite trail? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> have to pick. We Stop get that, that question. question. <laughs> we get that question all the time. And I've actually written a book called Oregon Favorites. So that, but uh, for me, it's the most recent trail I've hiked. And I asked Craig and he said, it's the trail I'm hiking right now. And Bart had an even better answer. He said, it's the next trail I'm planning to hike. But it really depends, I think, on the season and the place because the desert is not, the best trail there is not the same as the coast and trail in January is not the best one in August. So that's really why we need to spread out, find our own personal favorites, find new trails. That didn't answer the question, did it? <laughs> it's a trick, but it is, so. And we get asked that question all the time, like we're gonna reveal some amazing place. I mean, really, and every, it's, it's about your taste. I, I love hiking swamps, but I mean, being on Mount Rainier is amazing. I don't compare them. No. Fair enough. Great. Thank you. All right. Next question. I believe this is for all of you. Um, uh, a, a watcher or a attendee is, says, I'm curious about how these esteemed authors see their legacy and how they might be passing the baton at some point in the future. For example, uh, I know Mr. Sullivan regularly rehikes the trails in his book to make mm -hmm. sure that they're up to date. Uh, these books are incredible resources, but what about the future updates when perhaps the authors are no longer able to hike them? Well, well I'm not yeah. that old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and so you, you saw my legacy. I'm hiking with him right now. He turns six next, next, next month. There you go. <laughs> and Craig hikes 50 miles a day and, and hiking around Mount, Mount, Mount St. Helens in a day. Uh, and I, I also update my books like Bill, the same, the same thing all the time. And I'm counting on um, doing this well and as long as I can. I have longevity in my family. Um, I'm hoping to be out there in my 80s still doing it. But that's a, that's a good question. Um, maybe my son, we don't know. And I'm, I'm hoping that the person who asked that question will c give me a call and say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take over. Here, I'll give you the baton. There you go. <laughs> not planning to stop hiking anytime soon because it's just too fun. I mean, this has got to be a dream job. Yeah, yeah I'm going to die that. with a with a manuscript in the computer still as I'm going. That's the job. There's no retirement. You know? There's certainly no retirement for me. I, I got to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think everyone here will be glad to hear that. Um, great. Okay, next question um, from Jeff Carr. How do you deal with increasingly deteriorating forest service and other roads that lead to trailheads such as Silver Star and the trailhead at East Zigzag slash Burnt Lake in your recommendations? Mm, those two have gotten so bad, the access roads, that I describe a different uh, trailhead. Um, you just simply have to walk a little bit further. And this is not always a bad thing. Uh, Mount Hood and Silver Star Mountain are both very close to Portland and making the trail a little bit harder by backing, by leaving the last couple miles impossible to drive uh, makes it quieter. You have a kind of a choice. How do you limit crowds? You can just have a permit system and restrict them and have guards there and charge money, or you can make, let the road just deteriorate. Uh, the other side to that with Bill, I, I agree with what a lot with Bill saying too. Um, the other thing is too, I do uh, a lot of bike hikes and this is another area where these roads are so bad, you don't want to trash your vehicle. That's where that mountain bike comes in really handy. Boy, you can get in quite a bit on the bike, stash the bike and then do a nice easy hike. And, and then on the way out, it's just a downhill ride on, on the bike. So that's another way of, um, of attacking the situation uh, on, on bad roads. Yeah, or you can do like I do and borrow someone else's car. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Pro tip there. Uh, this next question is for Bart. Uh, will your bucket list focus on sites that can be filmed with no jet trails in the sky? Uh, <laughs> they, they ask uh, Mary. Yeah. Says she's really glad about vaccines being developed, but we'll really miss those clear skies. Yeah. No. That that's an interesting point. I know. I mean, so much. Um, of everything is on the landscape. Um, it, what I really like to try to find is uh, parts of, of the country that don't have anything in them, but that is a challenge. And with the, um, with the contrails, 
you know, it's funny because when I was walking these the Oregon Trail, you always see the jets going over, and I always think, boy, those people are going to travel the country in five hours, whereas it's taking me five months. But um, but as far as uh, the photography, you just kind of have to be to work with it and try to be clever about it. September 12th, 2001, I went up to Mount Rainier and there, was, there, were, there were no planes. It was amazing. I mean, it was a once in a lifetime opportunity when every plane in the country was grounded. And that was for a couple of days. And I remember that I just, I'm heading up to the mountains. It was quiet and it was clear. It was unbelievable. I don't hope anything like that ever happens again, but that was, that was an opportunity that, that, um, that was there, you know. All right. Um, next question. Uh, we have an anonymous person asking, what's the best way to get started? I have limited to no experience of hiking, but do want to do more but also do not want to burn myself out by going too hard too fast. So any tips for folks who are looking started with hiking? I, I mean, this is where the urban trails can be so advantageous um, because you don't have, it's not like you have to hike far. It's just what you want to do, what, what feels right for you. And there's so many uh, state parks nearby. And just, if you just go out and enjoy the day, enjoy a couple hours and don't overdo it. Um, that's a good way to start that I would recommend. The, the book that we've been talking about tonight weighs four and a quarter pounds. Don't use this as a book to take with you on the hike. This one is the why, the why to go hiking. If when you want the how to go hiking, Craig and I have written lots of books about the how. Uh, with easy hikes all rated by where they are and difficulty and you can pick hikes that are easy enough for kids and short, no elevation gain. Uh, so uh, get inspired by this beautiful picture book and then try one of the others for details. And the other thing I, I, I like to add too is uh, consider joining a hiking group, getting involved because what's happening with a lot of newer hikers, um, they're seeing all these pretty images and, and going out to the, these wonderful trails, but they're ill-prepared. And that's, that's tough. You don't, some of those, you don't want to learn the hard way. So joining the Mazamas, joining the Mountaineers, uh, the Chemekinans, um, the Obsidians, all these hiking groups, uh, and it's lots of resources online, lots of great books. And, and, and again, it doesn't have to involve a lot of money or a lot, but there's some really important things that, um, that I think everyone should be aware of before they hit the trail. Great, awesome. All right, last question, and it's for Bart. Um, would you recommend nature photography as a career? <laughs> well, I've been doing this now for 28 years, and I still, and there's no way I can retire. I, I, I'm not looking for retirement, but it, it is a challenge. I mean, it's basically, it, it really comes from your heart, whether you want to do it and whether you want can put up with the, the hardships, and there are a lot, but um it, when looking back, I mean, there's no way I would could trade what I've done for any amount of money. But um, it is one of those situations where you kind of, um, you, you can have a life of rich experiences, but not necessarily a life of a rich bank account is, I guess, how I'd say. But I am hoping to make money at this at some point. <laughs> <laughs> when you grow up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Someday yet. Exactly. But about life and rich experiences, I think that tops everything. And that's really, uh, I, that's really what hiking does for, I think, for all of us. I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. Marvelous. Thank you so much, you three. Um, really quick, before we let folks go, I'm going to announce the raffle winners. Um, I did this with a random name picker online since we're doing everything digital here. So I don't have a number or anything. So you're all just going to have to trust me that this was fair and square. Um, but our raffle winners who will be receiving a lovely uh, copy of this book um, are Paul Henry, Melanie Glock, Susan Woodside, David Prentice, and Patricia Warger. So congratulations to those folks. Hopefully they're in attendance. If not, don't worry. I'll be emailing you um, for details, getting your shipping address and stuff like that. So just wanted to announce that here and uh, I'll be in touch with those winners. And uh, thank you so much to everyone who made it here this evening. Big thank you to Bill and Bart and Craig for sharing your beautiful work and your wonderful experiences with us. Um, we really, really appreciate it. And uh, take care, everyone. All right. Thanks, bye.
Happy trails, everyone. Happy, Happy trails, trails, everyone. Happy trails. <laughs>